I'm going to start with a disclaimer that I'm a malariologist, not a vaccinologist. So if you have any of those questions you just asked, we'll, we'll bring them to Barney. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the challenge of malaria vaccines. And as I was uh, preparing for this talk this year, I was given this this title a number of years ago, and it occurred to me um, that the challenges have changed, but there are still uh, a lot of challenges now. I don't know how to work this. Just the, green button. the green button. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to talk about four challenges. The challenge of malaria vaccine development, the challenge faced by the first malaria vaccine, rtss one our current challenge of meeting high demand with limited supply, and the challenge, uh, a general challenge of bringing a, a vaccine that's targeted solely to low and middle income countries through clinical development and delivery. But first a reminder that malaria remains a major cause of childhood illness and death globally. This is from the World Malaria Report 2023. And what you see is global trends in malaria deaths in orange and Africa uh, specific malaria deaths in blue. So you can really see that this is primarily a, um, a tragedy, tragedy in Africa. Um, you can also see that after some marked uh, improvement, reducing malaria mortality by about half between 2000 and 2015 with a scale-up of bed nets and the introduction of highly effective treatment with ACTs, we saw that the progress stalled. And in some countries in Africa, some high burden countries, there's even been an increase in malaria over the past five years uh, or seven years now. Um, so the, what we're seeing is that we've pretty much come, um, as far as we can with the tools we have at the level of coverage we have. And it's hard to push coverage up further. Um, and it's clear that we need additional tools if we're going to really drive malaria down. Um, in 2021, it was estimated that almost half a million children in Africa died from malaria. So still a major problem. So these are the tools that we have to fight malaria. Insecticide-treated nets remain the cornerstone of our, our interventions against malaria. In selected areas, we uh, use a, a high-resource-intensive um, uh, IRS, uh, uh, insecticide residual spraying. Um, we use uh, drugs as prevention in different settings for different populations or different endemicities. And since 2021, we have a malaria vaccine. Uh, it's thought that with the addition, the widespread uh, addition of this vaccine, an additional 40 to 80,000 child lives can be saved per year. All right, so now I want to speak about the challenge of malaria vaccine development because it's taken over 60 years to get us where we have a vaccine um, available for prevention of malaria in children. And why is that? Um, I think Barney spoke about how, how vaccines take decades, but uh, six decades is quite long. Um, well, first, it's a, a very complex organism. The parasite has over 5,000 genes. A large proportion of those are devoted to immune evasion, such that in nature, the parasite can efficiently establish new and repeated um, uh, subclinical or chronic infections. There are multiple parasite stages as shown in that cartoon and multiple strains. Um, so there's multiple antigens, high antigen variation, uh, and it's difficult to find where the, the appropriate target is for a vaccine. Regarding the immune response, acquired immunity is stage specific and strain specific, although there is cross reactivity. And there are some real challenges in vaccine development. We have no validated correlative of protection. And so you have to go pretty far down the clinical development pathway before you know if a vaccine is going to be successful. Um, we do now have a human challenge model. This is an important addition to uh, malaria development, but there's variable correlation with what's found in the, the results of a human challenge model and field efficacy. And the, the clinical development pathway is quite costly, um, and there's little incentive to manufacturers who are not looking at a high-income market once they uh, find a vaccine that's efficacious. 
a few, uh, a, a little bit about vaccine targets and strategies. There are three major vaccine strategies used. There's the pre uh vaccines, the blood stage vaccines, and the transmission blocking vaccines. We have some nice candidates for all of these stages now. Uh, the recommended vaccine, RTSS AS01, is a pre erythrocytic vaccine. It targets the sporozoites or the infected hepatocytes, and the uh, intention is to prevent initial infection before illness begins. If there was sufficiently high efficacy of a pre erythrocytic vaccine, that also would be a transmission blocking vaccine. The blood stage vaccine uh, stops the replication of the parasite, um, and the transmission blocking ac actually works in the mosquito itself with the maturation of the parasite in the mosquito and prevents onward transmission. We are currently reviewing the second malaria vaccine, um, and that's R21 matrix M. That also is a pre erythrocytic vaccine. So uh, we we now have a rather robust pipeline for vaccines, which is pretty exciting. Um, and for all stages, as well as uh, some vaccines targeting P. vivax, most most target P. falciparum, which is the uh, the parasite that leads to most uh, severe illness and death worldwide. Um, and a couple vaccines that are looking to target malaria and pregnancy, another very uh, vulnerable stage of uh, uh, for for women. Uh, with malaria. So we've talked about RTSS, ASO1, R21 matrix M is, is uh, in an ongoing phase three trial. There's a lot of work about around PFSPZ, which is a whole sporozoite vaccine. Um, we're looking forward to seeing what happens with mRNA vaccine, that they're beginning their phase one first in human trial. And I, I take what Barney said about the um, uh, the, the difficulty if you've already been uh, exposed to a, a pathogen. Um, RH5 is a blood stage vaccine that is promising, and we're looking towards a trial where R21, the pre erythrocytic vaccine, is given with RH5, so that will be a multi-stage vaccine. So pretty exciting time for, for vaccines. I'm going to move to the challenge of the first malaria vaccine, um, RTSS AS01. This vaccine itself took over 30 years from discovery to recommendation um, for use. Um, and it was a, quite a long path uh, for this vaccine. So I'll just take a little time on this. In, in 1984, GSK established a team specifically to discover and, and develop a malaria vaccine. And in 87, they joined um, with RARE. Uh, and did develop the first uh, candidate vaccine with an immune response. Then there were a number of clinical trials, phase one and two, and then it came to the point where they wanted to go into a large phase three clinical trial. But you need a lot of money uh, to take a vaccine um, into these late stage clinical trials. And it was with Gates Foundation funds and M Path MVI that this large phase three trial was able to be conducted in 11 sites in seven African countries, uh, 15,500 children enrolled in two age groups. And that trial ran from 2009 to 2014 with the trial results published in 2015. And with those results, the EMA granted a positive scientific opinion under Article 58. The vaccine was then reviewed by WHO, and on advice of our expert advisors, uh, WHO recommended large pilot evaluations to answer some key questions on the vaccine in routine use. And these were specifically the feasibility of delivering the vaccine, which had a novel schedule. The vaccine is given from five months of age, three monthly doses, uh, and then, because of waning immunity, a fourth dose is needed to prolong protection, and that dose is given somewhere around 18 months or two years of life. So these are time periods when children are not usually coming in for vaccines. And there was concern that parents may not bring their children in, and scarce resources would be wasted. 
Um, there also were three safety signals that were seen in the phase three trial that were serious and needed to be resolved. And so this also, uh, the pilots also gave that opportunity to rigorously rigorously evaluate those safety signals. And then tied to feasibility was the question of impact. If parents don't bring in their children, then you aren't going to see impact. Um, so the it took three years to get the funding and set up the uh, surveillance systems for the pilot implementations. They began in 2019 after national regulatory approval uh, in uh, Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. Uh, the vaccine was delivered through the routine systems with an independent uh, evaluation by research partners. And after two years of piloting, uh, there were sufficient data to show that the vaccine was safe and impactful. And in October 2021, WHO recommended the vaccine for use. Um, in December 2021, uh, the Gavi board decided to fund the rollout of the vaccine. And then in uh, 22 and 23, applications started coming in from uh, to Gavi, and already 14 applications have been approved. Um, but to point out that with the pilot introductions, uh, the the time of from EMA approval to vaccine recommendation was uh, six years, and rollout now will begin in early 2024. Um, so that's eight years. So uh, it did result in uh, important information learned, but of course some delays. So um, this, uh, I just want to say a little bit about the phased uh, pilot introductions that were supported by WHO. Um, these uh, were introductions that were subnational, as I mentioned, in three, these three countries, um, with rigorous evaluation through Sentinel Hospital surveillance and community mortality surveillance. So the countries chose their pilot areas, which are those areas that are in color here, and then the surveillance systems were set up throughout. And then the areas were randomized to either start vaccinating in 2019 or start vaccinating later, um, which all three countries started at the end of last year. And this provided the opportunity to compare uh, the safety and impact in the areas that were vaccinating compared to those that were not vaccinating. And these are the results that uh, after two years of implementation, it's now been 40, over 44 months of implementation. But at the time that the um, WHO recommendation was made, uh, what was found was that the vaccine was feasible to deliver. There was very good uptake uh, of the vaccine. There was no negative impact on uh, the the uptake of other vaccines, ITN use, care-seeking behavior, the vaccine was shown to be safe. There was no evidence of those safety signals being causally related, and there were no signs of new safety signals. And now after 4 million doses have been given, that, that remains the same. Regarding impact, the vaccine introduction resulted in really a substantial uh, level of impact in this real world setting. So we aren't talking about efficacy, we're talking about the vaccine being introduced. Kids uh, are meant to receive three or four, well, four doses. At this time, it was mostly three doses. Uh, some come in, some don't. But once the vaccine was introduced with this period of scale up uh, included in there, there was a reduction in um, hospitalized severe malaria by 32% and about a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality in children age eligible to receive the vaccine. So really substantial impact on mortality, which also implies that uh, malaria uh, contributes to much more mortality than just malaria-specific mortality, which we, we knew from other studies in the past. There also was an interesting equity component that came in. Um, we found that because of the high coverage reached with vaccines, rather rapidly, by the way, uh, in a, a functioning system. In malaria, we usually have to go out and make a new system to deliver an intervention. Um, but this was rather uh, amazing to see that uh, the, the vaccines introduced, health workers know how to give it, children come in, and you suddenly have 70, 80, or 90% coverage of, of vaccine uptake. Um, but because of that high coverage, we saw that children who weren't using other interventions, such as ITNs, which about 50% of children across Africa use, 
um, you, you had much more access to malaria preventive measures. And about 90% of children in the pilot areas ended up using either an ITN or receiving the vaccine. Of course, we want them to receive both because in malaria, you have higher impact when you layer your interventions. All right, so here's a recommendation. On October 6, 2021, the, the uh, Director General announced that WHO recommends the vaccine be used for the prevention of P. falciparum malaria in ch for children in regions with moderate to high transmission, as defined by WHO. So that is a large proportion of Africa, as you can see, and some important areas in Papua New Guinea and probably India, maybe South America as well. Now I want to move to our current challenge of high demand um, with limited supply. Uh, so those areas I just mentioned, if we just look at Africa, there are 25 million children born each year in areas of moderate to high transmission. If you have a four-dose vaccine schedule, that's about 100 million doses you need per year. And, and the forecasting is we need a minimum of 80 million doses per year. However, the uh, manufacturer GSK is only able to provide 18 million doses between 2023 and 2025. Um, so why is this? There's a single manufacturer. Uh, they had to go idle during the period of, um, of uh, pilot implementation because there was no demand. So they're just now moving to commercial dose manufacturing. Um, they have uh, an old uh, facility that they will make redundant, and so they need to have a tech transfer, which takes time to BBIL in India. So all of this uh, is really uh, severely limiting supply availability. Gavi has announced that this vaccine, um, they've seen unprecedented demand. They usually receive four or five applications per year for new vaccine introductions, uh, since the applications were opened in July 2022, over 28 countries have said that they want to introduce the vaccine. 20 countries have already submitted an application. 14 have been approved to receive uh, support. And four applications, additional applications now are under review. Um, so what can we do about this? We, we certainly don't have enough initial supply to meet this high demand. Um, anticipating this problem, WHO convened a group of experts that included experts in malaria, child health, vaccines, human rights, ethics, and uh, mostly from the African continent. And they helped to develop a framework for the allocation of limited vaccine supply. I'm not going to go through all this, but just to say that the, um, the framework is based on ethical principles and overlays a foundational value of solidarity, um, stating that any child across Africa who lives in areas of need has as much um, uh, right to the vaccine as another child living in another area with similar area of need. Um, on the left, you'll see um, one of the uh, key considerations is that we honor commitments to the malaria vaccine implementation countries, those three countries that have already started introducing the vaccine, that there should not be a disruption of vaccine being provided in those areas because that could lead to distrust and um, in the EPI system. Um, so the first priority principle of the framework is that vaccines should go to areas of greatest need. Um, so the, the vaccine should be allocated to countries with areas of greatest need where the malaria disease burden in children and the risk of death are highest. The solidarity principle um, implies that no single country should take more than 20% of the available supply. So with that, there is a cap, a solidarity cap of a million doses per country during this period of uh, restrained supply. Just want to say that WHO feels very strongly that all children living in areas of risk should have access to a vaccine. And such a framework would never be ethical if we were not at the same time working very hard to increase supply. And that's one of our priorities with our, our with Gavi and our other partners. 
All right. So how did we define this area of need? Because we need to look across countries, um, not the highest risk areas within a single country. So a composite classification indicator was developed that looks at malaria prevalence or in some cases, malaria incidence and all cause, cause under five mortalities. And using that indicator, we were able to develop uh, need categories from one to five, with category one being those areas where children are very, very likely to, uh, at very high risk, I should say, of dying from malaria. And you can see on this map, this is illustrative uh, using um, global data, but you can see this large swath of area across Africa where children are living in that category one area. So those are the areas where the vaccine should first be allocated. So the countries um, themselves underwent uh, a, such a, um, a review of their own data, and when they submitted their applications for Gavi to Gavi, uh, they showed their areas of greatest need. Um, and so the darker areas on each of these, they aren't all purple, uh, are the areas of greatest need within countries. And you can see a country like Burkina Faso is almost all category one areas. A country like Ghana um, would would wait. They have very little uh, area of highest need, so they would wait before expanding outside of the uh, the pilot areas. Um, and those the countries that have stars are those countries that are affected by that solidarity cap. So they have uh, more than a million doses needed. Um, so they had to further stratify within their country. Um, all right, so I do want to speak about not all challenges, but at least one opportunity, and that is with this really high demand and this uh, real, um, not, not only by the countries, but by the parents in the countries for a vaccine, it does, does provide an opportunity to catch children up on other child health interventions. And this is particularly at top of mind during uh, following this period of backsliding during COVID. Um, so, you know, th this is showing a typical EPI schedule um, with the uh, PENTA or, or, well, I'm just going to say PENTA for now or OPV given often at 6, 10 and 14 weeks of age. And then the next time the child comes in is nine months of age. Now, most countries have on the books that children should come in monthly for well child checks and for weighing, but often that doesn't happen between these visits. And this period, six, seven, eight months of age, is often when children fall off the growth chart when they're weaning and they are suffering other illnesses, um, including um, diarrheal diseases. Uh, so it's good to have children come back during these periods. These, these dosing schedules, including the, the fourth dose, also provide the opportunity to catch children up on other vaccines, give them their vitamin A, uh, deworm from 12 months of age. Um, so, so, uh, what we need to do is figure out though how to really fully utilize those, those visits. And that's going to take some operation research. And then finally, just a, a briefly, the challenge in bringing a vaccine targeted to low and middle income countries through development to delivery, because I think these are lessons learned um, for future uh, other vaccines. Um, so I just want to speak a bit about the pilot recommendation and the lack of a high income market and the negative effect this had on the supply of the first malaria vaccine, result, which resulted in the situation we're in now. So when the pilot was recommended, um, instead of a recommendation for widespread use, this resulted in no demand for vaccine, of course. The manufacturer made the, uh, the vaccines that were required for the pilot introduction, but then the manufacturing plant went idle because there was no demand. Um, if there had been a market in a high-income country, the manufacturing would have continued to scale. And at the time of a recommendation for Africa, as we are, are low- and middle-income countries, um, the, the vaccine uh, would have, uh, at the time of end pre-qualification, there would have been sufficient supply of the vaccine to meet demand. Um, and the vaccine could have been introduced more readily and more lives saved. But the manufacturer could not assume that demand would materialize because it's really based on a number of important factors that you just have to see through. There has to be a positive WHO recommendation. There has to be pre-qualification for GAVI 
uh, financing and for UNICEF procurement of the vaccine, a funding mechanism needs to be established. So that would be Gavi in this case. The co-financing has to be reasonable. And actually, Gavi made a special finance co-financing mechanism for this vaccine so that uh, it would remove barriers to accessing the vaccine because it, its initial price is is nine um, nine point uh, three euros per dose. So it's it's. Uh, high for these countries to buy. Um, and then it has to be valued uh, by the, the target population or the parents in the country. Um, so if the countries had continued manufacturing with the assumption that vaccine would materialize before the WHO recommendation and funding mechanism secured, that would have been quite risky. Now, the second vaccine that's coming forward really benefits from um, what has happened and the pathway that's been laid by the first vaccine. They can see that there's high demand. Uh, there are other many other lessons learned during the pilot that will allow the second vaccine to come forward more quickly, and we could talk about those if you'd like. Um, but uh, they hopefully will be able to scale up and take some more risks uh, before a recommendation. And then finally, I just want to mention the the when we talk about two vaccines, the real importance of a healthy market and making sure that you have one, more than one vaccine um, manufacturer, uh, not only for vaccine security, but also for competition and keeping price down. So it's a priority to keep uh, two or more vaccines for malaria. Um, so in summary, uh, the complexity of the malaria parasite, the immune evasion strategies, the lack of a correlate of protection, all complicate the development of malaria vaccine. The pilot implementations have shown that the RTSS vaccine is safe, feasible to deliver, and has important impact. And this is even in the setting of good coverage with malaria control tools. And I'll also add it, it was in the setting of a COVID pandemic as well that this high demand uh, materialized. In this setting of high demand and limited supply, a framework for allocation is guiding equitable and transparent access to vaccine where the need is highest with phased introduction to other areas of, as vaccine supply increases. Um, although a vaccine targeted solely to low and middle income countries may be a highly effective intervention, the lack of dual market can pose considerable challenges and risk to successful clinical development and large scale deployment and um, delayed uh, deployment. And accelerating increased malaria vaccine supply is critical and a priority for WHO and partners. And if the second preerythrocytic vaccine, R21, comes through as safe and efficacious, that could really go far in closing this gap between supply and demand. All right, so with that, uh, I want to uh, just acknowledge a lot of uh, partners who have contributed to the MVIP and my uh, small team who's very hardworking. Um, and we even bring in people from other organizations and other parts of WHO to our team. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Hey, up there. Good morning, Mary. Thank you for this really nice talk. I have two questions. The first question I have about the travelers market. Is, is there, are there any talks about the travelers market for the malaria um, vaccine? No, we, we do that for ETEC and Shigella vaccines, and we think that that market can be a segue into a high income market. I wonder whether that is done for malaria. And then the second question that I have is, you know, we've read that the efficacy of the RTSS is around 35% in preventing severe malaria. There have also been a, a publication that reports efficacy of the R21, which reports to be higher. What is your suggestion as to how one should um, interpret the differences in these results? You know, what should be one cautious of and, and what, um, you know, considerations should one take into account when reading these, these results? Sure, just take it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. Um, so for travelers market, there, there is PF, uh, SPZ vaccine. They, they, the developers have spoken of a travelers market. Um, the issue is we have to get very high efficacy before we could have a vaccine for travelers use because we have highly efficacious drugs that can be taken to prevent malaria when you travel. Um, so we aren't there yet. Uh, when we get there, that will provide a, a second market. Um, it would have to be rather high, though, to offset the, the uh, 
let me say, to really um, result in a, um, a, a the manufacturer saying this is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, regarding the, yeah, thanks for asking about this. So this has been a rather interesting um, journey with the, uh, the RTSS and the R21 vaccine. And I mentioned that there were a lot of lessons learned with the pilot implementations and being able to really uh, reflect on vaccine efficacy and efficacy over time. And I think if I, uh, just to start, I mean, I'm just going to go to COVID vaccine for a minute. Um, you'll recall that the first efficacy results from COVID came out, I think, about nine, nine weeks after the COVID vaccine uh, w- was uh, nine weeks follow-up, very high efficacy. But then when you followed for a year, it probably was around, I, I don't know, I, somebody here will know, but probably around 50%, I would think. Um, so this is what we see with uh, RTSS and R21 as well, that you have very high efficacy early on. Uh, but there's waning efficacy and it's a sigmoidal curve. So you're, the, the, uh, waning happens, uh, you know, first six months, uh, you have quite high efficacy and then, uh, there's quite a drop off and then you have a lower efficacy that's maintained over time. Um, so what we've learned is that it's really important, uh, to understand the context where vaccines are being, um, being tested. And to report very clearly about the context and the follow-up time. So um, RTSS was also tried. I didn't show this, but um, there was a trial with this vaccine uh, in highly seasonal transmission areas. So that's where most of the malaria cases, almost all, occur within a four to five month period. And the strategy uh, using a seasonal introduction strategy or seasonal delivery strategy was to give the first three doses right before the high transmission period. When you do that, you are leveraging the period of highest efficacy against that period of high transmission. Then when vaccine efficacy wanes and drops off after six months, there's, there's no malaria. And so it's a very, uh, it, it's a strategy that really gives you high efficacy and high impact. In fact, it was found with RTSS that efficacy was non-inferior to seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which has an efficacy of 75%. So we're talking about 50% efficacy over a year for RTSS, 50-55% against clinical malaria, 50% against severe malaria, compared with 75% if you use this uh, very um, efficient strategy. Then you give a subsequent dose each year, again before the high transmission season, and again you get this high efficacy. Um, this is the same way R21 was tested. So you really have to compare like to like. It's clear that we can get high efficacy of both vaccines if we give them in this seasonal way. And that's exciting. The problem is that we don't have a platform for that. And none of the countries have said yet that they want to give the vaccine this way. There's another factor here, which is seasonal, mar- mal- seasonal malaria chemo prevention. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a highly efficacious um, uh, intervention where you go door to door and give a malaria drug uh, three days. It's a three-day treatment. You give it monthly throughout the high transmission season, again, with high impact. If you give the malaria vaccine and you give SMC, you have an additional benefit against malaria of almost 70%, additional benefit against severe malaria of the same. And they, although the numbers were small, uh, this was Daniel Chandraman and and colleagues, um, you also get benefit against uh, mortality, all-cause mortality and malaria-specific mortality that was substantial. So it's a, it's a, um, it's an exciting strategy. Um, Right now, uh, the, the, SAGE and MPAG Working Group, followed by SAGE, our, our expert advisory group for vaccines, has uh, made a clear statement saying these two vaccines, um, because they were not tested in the same context, in the same settings, you can't make a comparison saying one is better than the other. But both look uh, like they could be important additions uh, for, for malaria control. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel from Uganda. Um, 
Thanks so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, just uh, looking at the numbers, I mean, the, the, the amount of uh, uh, vaccines available. So uh, as you mentioned, so each county is likely to get uh, about 1 million or less. So if you look at 1 million uh, doses per year, uh, so not per year, for the next three or four years, so it means like per year, uh, I mean, with those doses, they would be vaccinating about 2,000 children in those three, four years. So then if you divide that into per year, it's about 500 children per year. So 500 children definitely is a very small number. I was wondering, rather, in, rather than talking about introduction, whether we could call them pilots or demonstration projects, and then we have some little bit more learning to allow a little bit more learning during that period while the supply also increases to see how it works, to make the countries ready to learn more so, so that by the time we have more supply, we've learned quite a lot and then we can actually be introducing. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm going to uh, correct myself. It's a million doses per year. Per year. So it's, it's a little more than what you've said. It's still oh. too little. Um, and, uh, and in these places, you can imagine these highest risk places where parasite prevalence is 40% and higher. Child mortality is about nine, about 10% or higher. Um, you can imagine that there probably aren't very strong health systems in many of these places. So in fact, um, the coverage, uh, assumptions are based on what these areas reach with their measles two dose. So um, it spreads out further in this way. Nonetheless, your point is very good. And the countries are using these as learning experiences as part of a phased introduction. Now, there is a scenario when, where R21 could be recommended for use as early as early 2024. Uh, it may take another year. Uh, it may not be recommended, of course, depending on the data. Um, but that means that, uh, it, and SII, the manufacturer, has said that they can scale up readily to meet demand. So, um, so it may be that the countries are using these uh, these initial periods to slowly introduce, and then they will be able to phase into the rest of the country rather quickly if R21 comes along a little more slowly, uh, waiting for the tech transfer to BBIL. Uh, if if we're depending only on RTSS, Great. here and they're here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, I had two questions. One in terms of how countries are being prioritized. Um, I noticed that Cote d'Ivoire wasn't on your country specific list, but on the map, if I read it right, it looked like a very high um, burden country, one of the potentially greatest need countries. So, is it a prioritization amongst those who have applied to Gavi, or is Gavi sort of actively reaching out, Gavi slash WHO, to countries that seem like they would be an important place uh, for this vaccine? And then um, related to what you were just saying with um, the uh, potential introduction of um, R21, is the assumption that it would be a sort of vaccine agnostic um, Gavi funding process? And is there any um, work being done around mix and match of the two in a single um, mm -hmm. in a single schedule, and how might the two be used in concert in a given country? All right. So, um, uh, so WHO and partners actually reached out to all of the countries that had Category One areas and held a series of workshops in person or uh, webinars for those that couldn't come to the in person workshops. So. Those workshops were to stratify um, the areas. It was up to countries if they came. Uh, many, many did. And many are uh, did not get their uh, application in with that first round. Right. So there are rounds every quarter for Gabby. Uh, the stratification, or sorry, the um, prioritization occurs among uh, applications that come in for Gavi that are IRC approved. Uh, for it, there are some countries that may come in that are not Gavi eligible, and that they would also go into that prioritization uh, process. Um, the the recommend the Gavi uh, approval is for a malaria vaccine. So if R twenty one comes forward, 
as recommended by WHO as pre-qualified, then it would fall under the the GAVI funding mechanism, which is which is really um, very good because it, it takes away any hurdles. And so, one of the priority um, research uh, questions is this mix and matching. It's not so much that we think there'll be two vaccines in the same country at the same time, but because of the limited t- supply, there likely will be some countries as they expand that will switch over to R21 and other countries will continue with RTSS. So we need to know uh, if a child start begun on their series for RTSS, for example, can they finish up with R21? Yeah. We'll take one more question just because you need a break. So... Thank you. My name is Grant from Uganda. Uh, what we normally see in malaria endemic areas is that uh, children who have had malaria before, they continue to get malaria. So the immunity they get from previous infections is not uh, permanent. So I'm wondering what difference the vaccine will make uh, like in terms of durability of immune protection? And do we risk, like, if especially we don't have sufficient coverage in children, like uh, we are exposing more those who are not getting infection from the natural uh, disease, or do we even risk uh, shifting the disease to higher uh, age groups? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So that was an important question in the pilots uh, and was an important question in the trials. Um, what uh, With this vaccine, efficacy is about 50% at a year. So the number of, that doesn't mean 50% of children don't get malaria at all. It means that the number of cases of malaria are reduced by about half. Uh, in some of these high transmission areas, uh, children get many, many cases per year. For example, in, in uh, Western Kenya, one of the trial sites, children presented to the clinic six times in a year on average with clinical malaria. Um, so, and those were new episodes of clinical malaria. So the, um, the, the benefit is that they would have fewer cases of malaria. Uh, they're much less likely to get severe malaria and that results in, um, uh, it, uh, let me say, and that allows for, however, this partial immunity allows for the development of acquired mu- immunity at the same time. Nonetheless, in the uh, in the phase three trial, there was a suggestion that there might have been rebound uh, or increased severe malaria in children who received three doses of the vaccine and not four. When uh, that uh, trial was followed out for seven years, the children at three of the sites, um, it was seen that children benefited whether they received three or four doses. So it really brought into question this idea of rebound. In the pilots, there's been, I didn't show this, but there has not been great uptake of the fourth dose of the vaccine. Less than half of children have, have come in for the fourth dose. It's a very hard time to reach children. Um, it was two years of age during the pilots. Ghana has now brought that back to 18 months of age and has already seen much higher uptake. But we still see this high impact, about a 10% impact on mortality. So if there is rebound, it's not sufficient to negate the um, the impact that's being seen. Um, nonetheless, we are conducting a nested case control study specifically to look at this question. So in short, it's always a theoretical possibility, rebound, uh, with any malaria intervention. We've looked for it with every malaria intervention that we've we've tried, including bed nets, including uh, uh, there was a nice study uh, in the 90s on giving children at that time chloroquine um, routinely to prevent malaria. And we do often see some rebound, but it's never been sufficient rebound to negate the benefit that was uh, achieved when the children were at a younger age and protected. 